Thanks, guys. All right, good afternoon. As Rocky said, I am State Representative Liz Bennett from Cedar Rapids, and I represent Iowa House District 65, which is Mound View, the southeast side of Cedar Rapids, and a good part of the Czech Village in that area. I do want to thank the humanists of Lynn County as well as Iowa atheists and free thinkers for inviting me to share my knowledge about the state of death with dignity legislation in Iowa. It is my hope that sharing information on this topic will empower you to engage in the process as advocates for compassion and for individual agency and end of life choices. Death, like sex, is a topic which Americans view differently than some of our brothers and sisters in Europe, for example. Um, Sir Francis Bacon has been quoted as saying, and I think this is apt to this conversation, men fear death as children fear to go into the dark. And as that natural fear in children is increased by tales, so is the other. People in America are as afraid of confronting the time when the body ceases to function as they are uncomfortable with the sexual functioning of the body. Despite the thread of Protestant Christianity woven into American culture and its promise of an afterlife, Americans are very afraid of this topic. Americans feel, fear death and the idea of taking agency over that time of life has seemed as anathema to many people. When discussing this issue in a religious versus sexual, secular context, <laughs> <laughs> hey, <laughs> okay, a fundamental question of worldview is at play. Are the events of our lives divinely orchestrated by a higher power who makes plans for us, intervenes in our lives, and exerts some control over what happens and when? Or, are we free agents with responsibility to determine our actions and morals, with the, re the right to determine what happens to our bodies and when? The national climate on this issue is shifting dramatically, likely in response to cases such as Brittany Maynard's, and there are people advocating for end-of-life choices right here in Iowa, such as Ankeny resident, who we discussed earlier, Jennifer Holm, who recently stopped pursuing a lawsuit due to her own failing health. One of my constituents has had a long battle with cancer and has contacted me several times asking me to support death with dignity legislation. And this is a topic that I'm repeatedly contacted on by constituents and other people in Iowa. A Des Moines Register poll published on March 10, 2016 indicates that 56% of Iowans favor allowing terminally ill people to end their lives using medication prescribed by a doctor. So let's make sure that we are clearly defining the issue. Death with dignity laws are laws that allow physicians to prescribe medication to qualified, terminally ill patients in order to hasten their death. As an overview, it's important for us to look at the national context of this issue. Currently, Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and California so that's Oregon, Washington, Vermont, and California have passed death with dignity laws. Montana allows physicians to assist terminally ill patients in ending their lives by Supreme Court decision. In Iowa, as most of you know, we are having this conversation. It hasn't gone that well yet, <laughs> um, but we know that when we're going to change policy, especially policy that is concerning um, or invokes fear in people, we're gonna have to have a long conversation about that. And that's not always bad, especially when we're talking about a policy that we wanna get right and we wanna make sure is doing what we actually want it to do. So I sit in the State House. I'll give you a quick overview of what happened in the State House over the past two sessions about this. And I'll tell you it's gonna be real quick because basically nothing happened. Uh, Representative Brian Meyer was the lead sponsor of House Bill 65, the Iowa Death with Dignity Act, that was a companion bill to a Senate file. This was referred to subcommittee and for lack of better language, it died a quick death there, uh, with two Republicans and one Democrat on the subcommittee. The companion to this bill, Senate File 2051, 
did get lots of play and lots of media and without being partisan, this is a good time to point out that it does matter who controls each house of the legislature. It is important to know that the majority of either the House or the Senate controls which bills are assigned to committee and who sits on that committee. So you can get rid of a bill real quick by assigning people to a committee, assigning that bill to a committee and then assigning people to that committee who are going to be hostile to that bill. And that's what we saw happen in the House. Um, so luckily we did have a robust public conversation around this issue in the Senate. We had a hearing. Um, Senate File 2051 is based on Oregon's death with dignity law, which has been in place since 1997. So we've, we've seen the effects of this type of bill for a long time. Um, I guess that's almost 20 years, which uh, is a little bit crazy for me. Seems like I was just listening to my Walkman and not having a good time on vacation with my family in you know, San, uh, San Diego in 1997. But, um, so 20 years, a long time. It did not pass out of committee in the Senate, but people are still talking about it. There's a conversation going on that continues. Here is how this law would work. This is important to know how it would work. An Iowa resident who is terminally ill, 18 years of age or older, and competent to make his or her own medical decisions can begin the process by making an oral voluntary request to a doctor to end his or her life. At least 15 days later, the patient would make a second oral request followed by a written request. Very important to know that this would require a written request. This written request would be witnessed by two individuals and at least one of these individuals cannot be a relative or entitled to a portion of the patient's estate, a nursing home employee or owner, or the attending physician. The patient would be counseled not to take life-ending medication in public and not to take it alone. Life insurance or survivor's benefits of a person who ended his or her life this way would not be affected. That's very, very important to the families of people who are terminally ill. So not surprisingly, conservative organizations such as Iowa Right to Life, the family leader, Concerned Women for America and the Iowa Catholic Conference were opposed. The, ACL, the ACLU supported this legislation. Um, and interestingly, most medical organizations registered as undecided, except for the Hospice and Palliative Care Association of Iowa. Um, at this time, I have not been able to find out why exactly they did register as opposed. Um, especially since a lot of times in these converse conversations, hospice nurses seem to be some of the most outspoken proponents for this type of legislation. So I am still doing some research on that. Um, on the national level, the American Medical Association does officially oppose right to die laws. So I think it's really important when we're, when we're thinking about the policy to look at some of the different factors that are coming into play. Um, it's not necessarily just conservative versus liberal, liberal or religious versus secular. Um, opponents of the law highlight concerns that allowing a person to end his or her life in response to terminal illness sends a message that people should just quit over life's hardships. Uh, this is a paraphrase of something that was uttered by a conservative lobbyist um, in one of the hearings. I do personally believe that this argument fails to account for the reality of life with a terminal illness. And I do find it irresponsible to equate having a terminal illness to life's general hardships. I think it's really inappropriate. Um, other people voice concerns that allowing a law like this might encourage suicide among non-terminally ill people. Um, other concerns relate to possible coercion by fatigued caregivers or people who could benefit financially from another person's death. As I said before, this is an important consideration when we write these laws. If our goal is compassion 
and personal agency, we should be sure we're building appropriate safeguards into any proposed process, especially one with finite consequences. But in the provisions of Senate File 2051, I do think that that has been addressed in the requirements for people who can witness uh, the signing of a document requiring life-ending medication. I hope that what I've shared with you has given you an overview of where we're at in the nation, where we're at in Iowa. Um, but I do want to return from a policy focus to focusing on people to close. On February 6th, Des Moines philanthropist David Hurd, who struggled with Lewy body dementia, a disease of which the symptoms resemble both Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, jumped from his sixth floor condo, resulting in his death. At his memorial service, Pastor Mark Stringer, his pastor, described a letter Heard had written to his adult children 17 years prior that were he to face health challenges that would take away his quality of life, that would leave him stuck with a bleak and hopeless future, he would choose to end it on his terms. So my question for all of us having this conversation is that what if those terms included planning? What if they include, included spending time with family members and faith or spiritual leaders, if that's part of a person's life, in preparation? And what if the terms of passing for terminally ill people resembled what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has described as, quote, neither frightening nor painful, but a peaceful cessation of the functioning of the body. And I leave you with that. I do believe that Rocky left time for some questions, um, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Yes? At the hearing, post-legislative session, the moderator failed to adequately police the commentators. Hmm. In other words, the pastors and ministers hogged a large portion of the time that was to be used by uh, patients giving their testimony because some of them would require more time naturally. Is there a way that we can prevent that from happening going forward when we go to legislative sessions and sit in as advocates? You know, that is a good question. And as a newer legislator, I have not yet had occasion to learn who decides who the moderator would be. Um, I suspect that there are guidelines that the moderator is to follow. Um, but I really honestly need to do some research on that. And you're bringing up to me something that, um, out of fairness and respect to individuals who come to offer their testimony, should be taken into account. So I need to find out about it. Thank you. We do too. Thank you. Absolutely. Her situation is particularly interesting. He said 17 years before his death that he doesn't want to go through it. And I have said that since about 20 years ago. When you've got six months to live, depending upon the circumstance <coughs> of it, you may not be able to self-deliver. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. of one case particularly, a very, very well-known international atheist died of esophageal cancer. Mm -hmm. You cannot self-deliver with 100 tablets with esophageal cancer, mm -hmm. particularly if you're not diagnosed at that moment, which mm -hmm. nobody is. By the time you find out about it, you have trouble swallowing. Somebody with Lewy body syndrome and Parkinson's, both, is not going to be able to swallow 100 tablets. Interesting. So that does bring up some limitations of the law that we're looking at. And I'm curious as to the political limitations and considerations of changing the law so that someone else would administer in a different format. As it is in Canada, by the way. Ah, okay. So Canada. Um, good laws and Celine Dion. Mm -hmm. what, what are you gonna do? Um, but I'm, I'm just really curious, especially with states like Oregon going the way that they've gone 
on the issue in a context, you know, of course, Canada views a lot of things a lot differently than the United States does, uh, which is an understatement. So I'm wondering if methods of delivery are a situation where the people who have worked on these laws, worked with polling and things like that, have said, well, let's see if we can get something to help as many people as we can help and get a law that we can pass. Um, but I, I think you bring up a valid point. I'll, I'll follow it up and then I'll leave you alone. Uh, each of the provinces in Canada has administered their national law a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, in Montreal, a doctor's self-deliverance is mandatory because they don't want the, to take a chance that the patient botches it and is worse, worse off. Right. So, right. And that, that's, uh, that's a consideration. You know, and especially when you're talking about compassionate care, mm -hmm. that's absolutely a consideration. So, a lot of things to think about. Other questions? Um, I, in what you were describing, this is applying to people 18 or older, which mm -hmm. I understand cognitive ability to make a decision. Mm -hmm. What about teens and children and infants who are in the same static category? We haven't touched that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, <laughs> What I have found so far is that if you want to get a law passed, especially on a hot, hot issue that invokes fear, concern, and many people, you need to really control what we're talking about. It's the same thing with medical marijuana. Um, you know, so there are a lot of people out there advancing the argument that, well, hey, we shouldn't be just focusing on medical marijuana. Um, why don't we just decriminalize all marijuana and then pe people can do what they want? Um, what a concern is, is that for those people who are suffering, who we want to get them medication um, and ease their suffering, when you start conflicting those issues, the public approval for getting them that medication goes down dramatically. So, you know, politics politics is a hard thing because you're taking into consideration the feelings, the beliefs, um, you know, not just beliefs about life and death, you know, religious beliefs, um, ethical beliefs, uh, beliefs about the government, um, beliefs about the nature of people, um, and things like that. So sometimes things do have to be confined and really narrowly construed to get anything done. But you're, but you're bringing up that there are certainly absolutely situations where people are in intractable situations of suffering and um, I don't know that we have <coughs> the framework as a nation to deal with that issue especially as it concerns children because it especially with the money in politics if you touch that issue you are going to get ads saying that you are killing kids mm -hmm. so Thank you. Are we? That's it? Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate your time.